I was coaching a group of 330 at Australia's largest insurer, IAG, and they wanted to transform in a very high boundary conservative business. And um, I didn't really know how to do it. I was the only change agent there for 330. And I wound up making up something that um, we've variously called self-propagating transformation or pull transformation. And we got a nice win. It took about uh, ooh, the better part of a year to get the 330 folk into a place where they were actually happy and productive and all in little teams. And you might wonder how one person could do that. But so I'll spill as much of the beans as I have time for this evening. It's not that difficult if you do it differently to the way it is normally done. I didn't know about the way it is normally done. I was faced with um, having to solve problems and I solved them. So I was happy with that. And then um, that got me invited to go and be strategist and coach for a transformation of Australia's largest banking group. Australia is not that big a country, so it was only 50,000 people. But it was still pretty big from my point of view. This was Commonwealth Bank of Australia. And it took about three years before I wound up sharing a stage with Michael Hart, uh, who was CIO, group CIO there. And he declared Agile is now one of the five pillars of this bank's future. And I realized that I'd learned enough that I needed to come up with some way to package it and, and share these ideas. Um, business agility wasn't much of a noise uh, uh, back in 2014, 15. Uh, so I was trying to come up with something and I came up with this acronym. So I'll, I'll show you what the acronym is about in just a moment. But the key thing that I wanted to do was I wanted to avoid making yet another framework. And I wanted to avoid selling certificates for a living. I, I really wanted to, um, to get into sharing this stuff as broadly as possible. It took a couple of years to figure out how to do it. And we wound up setting up a little ecosystem that works like Linux. We use Creative Commons licenses for just about everything. We have a commercial license for the coaches that are involved. We don't have trainers. Our idea is that we, Training is something coaches do as part of the work of coaching. So uh, we're an ecosystem of, of coaches and we're about 120, 130 worldwide now, all sharing this uh, toolkit we call Xscale. So the Xscale Alliance is the, the group and Xscale is the toolkit. And, and it's, um, it's not a framework, which so that's to say we apply YAGNI to the practices of Xscale. It's, um, and it's, it's not uh, about saying, well, you must do these things in this way. It's about solving the problems our clients have. So you could think of it as a pattern language if you're familiar with pattern languages. But the idea is that you can use it with any other framework. Uh, there's no reason you shouldn't, we're fully agnostic. So we're not pushing a barrow. What we're trying to do is provide solutions that promote business agility, business throughput and <laughs> Most importantly, what we're gonna talk about a lot uh, uh, today, tonight, depending on where you are, is the idea of cutting through bureaucracy. We're going to see bureaucracy as the enemy of agility. And unfortunately, a lot of what we see from frameworks doesn't reduce bureaucracy. Uh, we are living in a, a, a world that's, well, more than VUCA, I dare say the world we're living in is snafu. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that people are doing uh, with agile frameworks it doesn't help. So uh, the stuff we're gonna be talking about is moving in a, a direction that is not antithetical to anything in the agile world. It's more a matter of saying, for the sake of business agility, we need to do some things differently. And you might go, wait a second, who cares about business agility? We care about business survival. Uh, we have a bunch of businesses that are falling over left and right. We, we have enormous challenges that we've never seen before, not in, not in any of our lifetimes, even those of you with enough gray hair to, to regard yourself as, as old as, as me. Um, and you would expect business agility better be useful for that or otherwise we have no time for it. I would like to suggest to you that um, Without business agility, our clients are going to fail. They'll go under. 
that this is the key distinction. And I'll give you a definition to go with it. Um, I define business agility as the capability to adapt to changing market conditions. Now, anyone who has been following the State of Agile survey, which is the largest and longest running uh, Agile survey or survey of Agilists in the world, anyone who's been following it knows there is this terrible number. And the number is either 4% or 6%, at least that's what it was the last two years. And that number is the number of Agilists who say that Agile helps their organization respond to changing market conditions. So given that responding to change is one of the four fundamental values in the manifesto, crumbs. So if we say that business agility means that, then I think we're on a pretty good wicket. Um, so then we have this word descaling. We are not saying, saying that scaling is wrong. We are saying that it's incomplete and that we, we have to worry about some numbers that the scaling movement is completely neglected. If any of you watched the intro video that we attached to the invitation where I interviewed Robin Dunbar uh, at the start of the year, you'll have some ideas about why. Uh, Robin Dunbar, Professor of Evolutionary Psychology at uh, Oxford, uh, he's the guy who came up with this thing people call the Dunbar number, except that it's not his number. He doesn't care about that number. There's a Dunbar sequence and it has a power ratio built into it. There's a power ratio that's important. We'll see that turn up just a little bit later. But I'll, I'll move on because otherwise I'm going to be here for all night and I'll be gassing on. So suffice to say, uh, if you haven't heard about Xscale before, that's all right. We are tiny. Uh, we've only been around since ooh, 2016, 17. I think 2016 is when we first turned up in the Gartner Market Guide to Enterprise Agile Frameworks. Don't tell Gartner, but there were only two X-scale coaches in the world at the time, and I was one of them. So, um, but we, we seem to be moving along pretty nicely now. We've been uh, quadrupling roughly every year, and that's all pretty good. So what's X-scale uh, stand for? It's an acronym, exponential business. This is not saying that you can grow exponentially forever. We don't know anybody who's grown exponentially forever. This is saying that the curves we're working with when it comes to the growth of businesses and the destruction of businesses, that these are not linear. We see either exponential growth or exponential decay, which you could think of as logarithmic if you're that way inclined. And that these two things go together. We see sigmoid curves that start exponentially growing and then exponentially decay, or at least they go linear. And so the first uh, principle, the idea is, we need a way to stack these curves rather than to chain them if we're going to get the kind of kaikaku kakushin uh, exponentiation that we would expect if we take Toyota production system uh, seriously. For those of you who never heard of kaikaku or kakushin, only heard of kaizen, well, you have some reading to do. Aren't you lucky? Um, the, the fact is Taichi Ono left some things out when he was sort of bringing up the lean movement in the States and those things turn out to be pretty important. So we want to put them back in here. Uh, okay, so the XSS is simple design. Those of you who recall Beck talking about simple design, uh, that's sort of where we started, but we're very interested in designing ecosystems, not just experiences or code or devices. And we want to do this ecosystem design work breadth first, which means that a lot of what we get from design thinking isn't sufficient. So it's not to say design thinking is wrong. Um, and we see design working hand in glove with businesses and delivery and DevOps. Some of these are things that you don't hear from a lot of designers. So we see that this is all critical to design for simplicity. Um, and that's something that's also missing from design thinking. I'm not bagging on design thinking, it's very useful. Again, just not complete. Uh, continuous throughput, really should be continuous optimization of throughput. Uh, you might think you know what throughput is. Unless you follow Goldratt or, 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 or Steve Tendon, uh, some of those guys, I don't think you do. Uh, Goldratt gave a really, really nice definition of throughput. 
And it's not just about components of operating expense. It's about the relationship between sales and net profit and operating expense. And to understand how to optimize throughput means more than just playing with value stream maps and, and continuous flow diagrams. There's quite a lot more to it. Um, this weird and wonderful looking diagram on the screen, I'm not really going to explain this evening, but um, uh, we do have a, a, a video series uh, called the X Scale Podcast that um, uh, Stefan Wolpers and I recorded a couple of years ago. So if you get interested in this stuff and you want to watch some of those, you'll get the idea pretty quick. Uh, at the end of today, we've got a plug for a course, but you don't have to take the course. Most of the stuff is online at the same time. Well, you might want to, and there might be reasons why we can talk about that later if you want. Um, autonomy in alignment. You recall that whole thing called Spotify, that Spotify itself doesn't do anymore and that has been failing all over the world in lots of nasty ways. And it talked about tribes. And it talked about how wonderful it would be to have lots of little teams all aligning to one another and that autonomy and alignment are not antithetical. Well, it, it, the claims are okay, but they didn't actually go and look at real First Nations people to understand how real tribes do their business. They just made it up. And we thought, well, why don't we actually try and understand what real tribal societies actually do? And it turns out that the most sophisticated, at least the ones most sophisticated we've been able to find, is a, a, a tribal society called the Haudenosaunee. And you might have heard of them as the Iroquois or Iroquois, uh, uh, which was what the Europeans called them, what the French called them. Uh, Iroquois was a slang word, I think, for snakes. So it's not a very complimentary word, but they've, they've taken it to, to heart in the sense of calling themselves Iroquoian peoples. But I want to immediately disavow any sense of um, cultural, cultural misappropriation. We learn from these guys. We are inspired by these guys. We do not pretend to be these guys. And in fact, they do a lot of things we couldn't do if we wanted to. Um, but they came up with this thing called the great law of peace. And from this, we've been able to abstract some really simple social tools um, or practice patterns. And we're going to talk about some of those this evening. Leadership as a service, circles, and I don't mean circles in the sociocracy sense. I mean them in the quality circle sense. And that's quite different. So if you don't know the difference, you're going to have fun tonight too. And then, oh, today, depending on where you are. And then the Dunbar sequence, we'll talk about that a little bit too. This is where we start to think in terms of fractal. Now, you might go, wait a second, what's, what's remarkable about a fractal? The fact is that just about everything's fractal if you look at the right way. A tree is certainly fractal. You could look at a command and control tree and go, there's a fractal, very boring one. We want to understand organizations as fractals because we get a metric out of it. And we're going to talk about that metric. And the metric is the fractal dimension as applied to um, org charts as applied to graphs. And you might think, wait a second, I, I know something about fractals and I don't know how to do that. So we'll talk about that a bit too. Um, there's a reason why that's a really powerful metric. But when we talk about fractal organization, what we're really interested in is increasing the fractal dimension because that gives us an ability to think about how we can increase the richness of communication, both within a hierarchy and across a hierarchy. So we'll talk about that a bit too. And that's how we can get autonomy and alignment. We'll come back to it. Uh, triple loop learning. Uh, this is, if anyone who's seen the logo for Scrum anything knows about double loop, um, where you're trying to optimize workflow and value flow. We, we found that there is a third kind of flow that's critical to get business agility. And it's the flow of learning through the organization. So to be able to optimize this, that gets us into this idea of pull-based transformation, because it's a better way to go about that kind of um, optimization of learning flow. Um, 
there are structures that we're going to talk about this evening that fit into this idea of threes of threes of threes of threes. Uh, so in sense of fractal, we're kind of looking at a very, just very limited uh, number of levels of that. If you could think of, uh, oh, it says the word squad, I should probably say the word team. We're trying to avoid using uh, special source words, but that's okay. Uh, it's an old diagram. Some of my slides here I've souvenired from old decks. So uh, we don't usually use Spotify language and there's a good reason for that too, which we'll come to. But anyway, the idea is we don't want to have arbitrary numbers of teams in streams because it doesn't work very well. It's very difficult for people to organize themselves if you have too many of them. They, they can't get the alignment piece to work very well. So what we've found through experimentation uh, using a, a workshop we call the game without thrones. And there's one of those running for free online this month, if you get interested in it. Uh, what we found is that this, this, um, uh, these threes with a couple of neat practice patterns, they give us some advantages we can't get any other way. So that's why we have this cute looking uh, diagram, which we sometimes use as a logo too. And then finally, E in X scales ecosystems thinking, uh, we define an ecosystem as a network of mutual benefit. We're going to um, try and understand how mutual benefit could come to dominate a culture. I'm going to, to reinterpret uh, a little online animation some of you might have seen called the evolution of trust, but I want to interpret it in an organizational cultural way. And that's going to give us an idea about how we could promote the development of ecosystems, even in an organization that's presently dominated by bureaucracy. Um, now, I've got some definitions of bureaucracy later on, so I'm not going to go in, into enormous detail now, but I do want to explain the graphic here. This is a picture of a permaculture farm. Permaculture was invented by two of my countrymen, uh, uh, Dave Holmgren and I always forget the other one because he's dead. Oh, well, it doesn't matter now. Um, anyway, it'll come to me. Um, these guys in the 70s were convinced that the world didn't have long, that it was all going to go belly up when we ran out of fossil fuels. And everybody would have to leave the cities and and go and uh, and go back to the land, and uh, so they designed uh, a set of principles and practices for human-intensive small holding farms. Well, I don't think the world is going belly up. Obviously, it's not enormously healthy at the moment, but I am enormously optimistic about um, our opportunities in this century. And anyone who wants to argue that with me, I would be delighted. Uh, but maybe when we get to a bit of Q&A, we can talk about that if you want to. I'm hoping I'll give you enough food for thought that you'll completely forget about that and I might raise it at the end, but that's okay. I believe we are heading towards an age of abundance once we get past our current teething troubles, which might take some decades. Anyway, um, so suffice to say, ecosystems thinking in the abstract is critically important to us. If we can't find a way to promote networks of mutual benefit in the natural world, we're screwed. And if anyone who's seen the documentary Soil will know what I mean. But the trouble is the organizations we work with, their behaviors dominate the way we work with the natural world. If we can't promote networks of mutual benefit inside those organizations, it doesn't really matter what we do with the natural world. We're just gonna do stupid things. Uh, we say our, our culture, our civilization is going to do stupid things. So we need this way of approaching ecosystems, networks of mutual benefit and breadth first, whole board, positive sum. This sounds like hippie talk, but it turns out it's very concrete. And the practice patterns we get from permaculture, we've been able to generalize to real world organizations while still being faithful to where we got them. And I can say that with hand on heart, because we ran our stuff by Dave Holmgren and he gave us a nice blessing. So anyone who's interested in that, we can talk through that too. Ah, there's a lot of stuff about how we've been using this over the last five years on xkalance.org. And that's kind of our uh, external hub. 
uh, it's undergoing a very large revamp at the moment because it really, it, it reflects the ideas, but most of XKL Alliance is kind of invisible on XKLalliance.org. I mean, you can find some of the names, but we're, we're trying to make the community more visible there. So um, it, it, nevertheless, it makes a, a neat content hub at the moment in, uh, when it comes to events and selling this bookings and that sort of stuff. All right, enough about X scale, whatever the heck that's supposed to be. Let's talk about the meat and potatoes of uh, today. So we wanna talk about fractal organizations. Uh, well, every organization's a fractal, but the kinds of fractal, the kinds of structure we see. When we talk about fractal dimension, fractal dimension is a relationship between um, I don't want to go mathematical on you. It's a relationship, because of which I'm not certain I'm going to be very good at going mathematical on you. It's a relationship between a, a, a space or a set and, um, and a way of subdividing it or coloring it in. So uh, if we were to think about ordinary dimensions, uh, lines and planes and volumes and so on, well, we have very simple relationships between the way we subdivide them and the sizes of the parts, the numbers of the parts and the, the sizes of the parts. They're very linear. Um, when I subdivide a plane, I, I, I usually expect I'm talking about uh, things where I'm, I worry about surface area, where I have a square of the dimensions. If it's volumes and I'm talking about cubes of dimensions, if it's a line that I'm subdividing, then I, I, I expect I'll be able to measure, measure lengths. But there are some ways of um, chopping things up that give you fractional dimensions. And that's where this fractal stuff comes in. So we're going to come back to that idea. For now, I'm going to talk in real world terms and leave anything mathematical sitting on the back burner. That was more food for thought than anything else for now. So Apple under jobs, uh, there's this uh, lovely fellow, uh, Manu, I'm trying to remember his last name. I think it's Contel, something like that. Anyway, he, he did these famous cartoons for um, uh, Business Review, I think it was Business Review Weekly, uh, where he, he sort of had satirical looks at the the org charts of different organizations. So this was Apple under Jobs. And then, well, uh, when Jobs uh, turned up his toes, uh, it, it, it kind of got chaotic for a while. And then Cook and, well, for a while, Cook and Ive, and then Ive kind of, uh, along with a lot of other uh, very notable worthies at Apple, they all wound up taking a walk and Cook, introduced a lot of very traditional command and control structures, committee-based stuff. Um, and it's affected Apple's behavior. Pretty obviously, Apple hasn't really changed its product line, except cosmetically, since Jobs died. Um, I mean, I guess they introduced the Apple Watch, but it's just a small iPhone, really. And it's only sold like 30, 40 million units where uh, one generation of uh, iPhones sells a billion, so not really very significant. Everything else has stayed the same. They're not really in the innovation or disruption business anymore. Um, they they doubled in size in the, the last decade of Jobs' life five times in that decade. And since Jobs died, when he died, I think they were worth about 600 million. I don't think they've actually doubled once in that time. So their behavior has changed. And I'm going to suggest to you that that move from directly responsible individuals, that phrase, DRI, directly responsible individuals, there's a special meaning to that. It doesn't, it's not, it, does, it doesn't mean what it sounds like, but it means more than that. Um, so that movement from DRIs to committees is a movement towards bureaucracy. And we're going to talk more about bureaucracy as we go along. Um, there are plenty of other large businesses that have their own bureaucratic problems, different kinds. And this is again, Manu Contour, um, just very, very nice cartoons. I really like what he does. Um, but um, I don't want to go into enormous depth on uh, what these things look like. I want to understand why. What are the 
game theoretics that lead an organization towards business agility or towards bureaucracy. Now, um, I feel like before I go on, since uh, there's an awful lot of me gassing on in what I'm intending for this evening. So I wanna stop for a moment and do a bit of Q and A before we go on, because I'm going to walk you through something that's animated next. So any questions, perhaps if you write them in the chat, then Rich could, um, could read them and then he can tell them to me in order of whichever he feels is the most interesting. So do try and make your questions interesting. How would uh, that work? While people are putting messages into the chat, we already have one there from Abby. Yeah. Uh, so Abby, do you want to come off mute and read out your question for, for Peter? Good evening, Peter. Always good hey, to Abby. hear from you. Likewise. Yeah, always. You know, always um, I call the I call encyclopedic Peter. That sort of information. <laughs> I'm just old. There's nothing encyclopedic about. I'm just old. <laughs> no, I just say it's always it's always good to listen to you. Um, quick question, Peter. This my this question was lingering on my mind for quite a while. Now, um, how do you allocate work to teams? You know. Oh, it's a really According good to me, that I've. You know, I've seen like um, value stream mapping is a standard practice as for mm. enterprise architecture guidelines, right? Yeah. Are there, is there any other method or any other tool and technique you would suggest to yes. um, get the team involved and allocate work to them? Absolutely. Uh, it goes off in a slightly different direction than we're going this evening. But if you go mm. looking online uh, for Pirate Canvas and 3D Kanban, uh, then you'll hmm. see uh, a good amount of stuff there. The basic idea is um, we want feature teams to be delivering features, one feature at a time to a team, uh, and, and then we don't want the team to deliver stories from a different feature until they've finished this feature. We think of features as the, the atoms of release planning, um, and we don't want them to do that with the stories from more, more than one feature because if they do that, then it's going to take longer to deliver both of these features. And then you're going to lose ROI. We want to, if this is the higher priority feature, we want to do that. Or if you've got two teams, we want them to do them in parallel, but we want them to do all the stories from one feature, uh, not uh, all stories from lots. So mm -hmm. getting back to your question, if we have teams delivering features, then we want streams, business streams of teams that focus on an epic, and we'll break that epic down into features. And we want to do this just in time. We want to do this using a Yagni approach so that we don't have very many cards on the wall. And that way we can adapt quickly. So a lot of the trouble with value stream mapping, there's nothing wrong with value stream mapping, but a lot of the trouble with the way that people use this stuff is they break everything down to a story level and you've got all these little ticky tacky things. And then when change happens, you've got a lot of cost of change in moving all those stories around. If you do the sort of breadth first approach where you're mapping epics to streams and then within those streams, mapping features to teams, well, then you have a much easier time. So Peter, is it like dependability? Uh, basically, we want to decouple features and create teams individual, isn't it? So, um, so that um, there's no dependability across both the teams. Well, uh, we can factor the dependencies out into features in their own right. But we're going to wind up going a pretty fair distance away from the subject of today. So I'd say, let's take that one offline, Abby. And if you want to, uh, to okay. look me up, I'll point you. Cool. Okay. No, no, that's fine. Thanks, Peter. So Rich, any more questions or shall we move on? We have another one here from Hafez. Yeah, go for it, Hafez. Hello, hi, thank you. Um, so yeah, my question was about the reductive word when you spoke about the ecosystem learning. I yes. just wanted to, to know more about that when we speak about iterative and reductive. What cool. does that word stand for? Okay, so um, there are two reasoning systems we get from the Greeks, deductive and inductive. And then in design thinking, uh, there was a bloke in the 19th century named Peirce who came up with this thing they call abductive reasoning. And we wanted to do something that would reflect a different approach to any of those. And to give you an idea about the approach, you're familiar with the children's game of I spy or hot and cold. 
you know, kids will say, I start my life something beginning with uh, C and uh, uh, chair. No, bugger. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, it works very well in a room. But if you allow them to play, I spot my little eye, something in the entire universe, they cannot play that game. They'll spend forever guessing and they'll get very annoyed and they'll start crying and that sort of thing happens. And unfortunately, in design thinking, that's also a problem. We don't really have an idea about the frame. So the idea with reductive is more like the kid's game of 20 questions. Uh, one child says, oh, I've thought of something in the universe. And the other child says, well, is it animal, vegetable, or mineral? You might say, well, it's uh, mineral. Okay, is it uh, bigger than a bread box? Yes. Is it bigger than a whale? Yes. Is it bigger than the earth? Yes. And so as we come up with these yes and no questions, we are eliminating whole huge high dimensionality swathes of the universe with every question. We are re reducing the universe of inquiry until one child is able to go, Barnard star, you're talking about Barnard star within 20 questions. Um, now, I'm not saying that your kids are going to get to Barnard star, but it doesn't matter. You get the idea. This is the Sherlock Holmes method. When we eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the product we want to release. Make sense? Okay. Yeah, I just maybe have a friction on this. So you would be agreeing with me that when we are making this frame smaller, we are hindering creativity sometimes because the impossible, according to you, is not the impossible, according to me. So this, yes. kind, this is kind of closed questions yes. rather than open questions. I and it depends, but I agree with you. Uh, it can be helped by experts. But again, if we bring up these experts to make this frame, then this means that we are doing the opposite job of what we I want to do. I think we are having things. a violent agreement. I don't want to limit the frame. I want to make it explicit because if it's explicit and we can test the assumptions, well, then we have a chance of discovering that some of our assumptions are bad and there's actually a whole bunch of things we could do to hit the market that we're not even thinking about. So okay. I think we're on the same page. All right. I'll Thank take you. one more question before we go on, if there is one, otherwise we'll go yeah, on. Yeah, I was going to say, Peter, how, how much time do you still need to finish off? Because we do have another question here. And I think it's good, this go question at the moment, is bringing people into the conversation rather than just listening. So I'm not in a hurry. Uh, excellent. As long as, as long as we can finish on time, because people obviously will have other things that they've organised. No worries. Uh, so, so Ratsy, uh, uh, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Peter. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, in, in your mind, is fractal structural or temporal or both? Both. Because if we're talking about spaces, they could be as highly dimensional as you like. We can still make fractals in them. A fractal isn't necessarily something that's uh, a colouring of a uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, plane. Um, so uh, we could also be thinking about discrete iced spaces like an oil chart. And there are ways of dealing with those in terms of fractal dimension as well. So uh, if, for example, we could be thinking about a graph as a subset of a clique. And then we could say, okay, well, uh, there are cliques coming in multiple different sizes. So how could we understand how these subsets are turning up in these cliques? And of course, there are other ways of dealing with uh, fractals on networks of box counting and so on. But I, I, I like that idea that we work with the most general aspects of graphs, cliques, and cycles, and so on, to be able to describe them there. So, but so and so, if you've got something where your network is changing over time, great, you've got more dimensionality, but you could still be thinking in terms right. of fractal decomposition. Okay, thanks. Cool. All right, let's move on. Yeah, and would if people remember keep putting questions into. Uh, the chat, we'll come back to them again later. Beautiful. Okay, so I don't know how many people have seen this site. Um, I am going to um, talk about it in a different context. If you have seen it before, then you might be aware of. Um, so I'm gonna go through this real quick, far faster than uh, one should, but I just wanna get some concepts on the table. 
so this is a dramatization of the prisoner's dilemma, of the N party iterated prisoner's dilemma. And you might go, okay, well, that's, I don't really know what the prisoner's dilemma is. And if I did know what it was, then I don't think I would care about an N party iterated version of it. I am going to propose to you, that this makes a pretty good model of the development of an organization or of a culture in an organization. And we can generalize pretty well from this, at least enough that we can begin to make distinctions between agile, business agile organizations and bureaucratic organizations. So um, you might not agree and that's fine. I, I just want to get the concepts on the table and stretch your brain a bit. So the idea is we have here two players. We are this player and the other player is a robot with a fixed strategy. Um, and so we get to uh, play a game with this uh, other person with this fixed strategy. And I'll tell you what strategy is in just a moment. And in this game, we have a coin and the other player has a coin. And uh, if we want to cooperate with the other player, we'll both put our coins in the slot. But if we want to cheat the other player, we'll let them put their coin in the slot and we won't, we'll keep our coin. So if we cheat and they cheat, nothing happens. We both keep our coins in our pockets and there's no result. There's no improvement, there's no penalty. But if they're silly enough to put their coin in the slot, uh, actually, I think it's the other way around here. Um, we're silly enough to put our coin in the slot, with minus ones on us. They cheat us. You'll see it in just a moment. So if, if, if they cheat us, so in other words, they don't put the coin in the slot, we do, then they get our coin and they get another two coins. There's actually an incentive on them to cheat us. Now, let's imagine that we cooperate and they cooperate. So we put our coin in, they put their coin in, then we both get a plus two bonus. So that he can actually do better if he cheats me. And likewise, I can do better if I cheat him. So if we were to play this game just once, it would just be a guessing match, unless we really knew the other player pretty well. The, the reason it's called the prisoner's dilemma is the traditional form of this is, let's imagine we both rob a bank together and we get caught and the police say, well, if you will confess and the other, the other person doesn't confess, then you're going to get off scot-free. They're going to get a heavy penalty because they didn't confess. And you better confess quick because if, if you don't, they will. And then you're going to get a very heavy penalty for not confessing. And if neither one of you confess, then you'll get a little penalty, but can you trust the other player enough since they have an incentive to cheat you and get off scot-free? So this is the dilemma. Let's see how it plays out. So we're going to play, um, I'm going to play for you. Ordinarily, when we play this game, when we're using it in training, uh, we, we use, um, uh, something we call leadership as a service so that a group of people can make a decision together without squabbling. Uh, and the way we do it is very, very simple. We're going to show it later on. But, um, but basically I would pick one of you, let, let's say Abi, And I'd go, okay, Abi, I want you to be the leader. And what that means is that if everybody else is unanimous about the choice, then Abi doesn't get to decide. It's quite surprising. If they are not unanimous, then he will decide for them. And since everybody wants to keep their agency, they have a motivation to find a way to get to a common mind. This very simple change in decision-making protocol, because we're, we're used to, you know, there is a manager and we have to influence the manager and the manager will decide. If you do it this way, you get consensus decisions really, really quickly. And you can still work it in such a way that the leader doesn't lose their power. But we'll, we'll come back to that a bit later on. So uh, let's say, since I'm choosing, I'll go, I'm going to cooperate. So I'm the, I've got the red fez on and the other player cooperated as well. That's great. Well, since he's such a nice fellow, I think I can probably get away with cheating him. So I'll cheat him. Ha ha, I cheated him. So now I've got three coins, he lost two. I'm gonna go and cheat him again since he's so gullible. No, he's not so gullible. Okay, how about again? No, he's onto me. 
I'll try cooperating this time and see what happens. Oh, he cheated me. Okay, so that chap in the blue fez, he's what's called a copycat. He plays politics. He plays the game. What he does is he starts out cooperating with you. If you cheat him, then he'll cheat you back. He'll copy what you did last time. If you then cooperate with him, he'll cooperate. But he's always aware that, you know, he can't really trust you exactly. So he's just going to try and judge how he should play based on your behavior. Um, now, this person in the black hat, they do something a bit different. So I'll try cooperating with them. Oh, they cheated me straight out of the gate. And the fact is, the person in the black hat always cheats. That's their strategy. Um, and you might think, wow, I've worked with quite a few of those. Um, and the fact is, there's a reason why people play like that. And a lot of the reason why is because they've learned that that's a way for them to get ahead. Now, this person in the pink hat, they have a different strategy again. And I don't think it'll surprise you too much. What they do is they always cooperate. So that means I can cheat them rotten and they won't respond by cheating me back. So um, I can take advantage of them as much as I like. Uh, it's not very nice of me. Now this person in the yellow hat, uh, I'm gonna try cooperating with them and they cooperate with me just fine. But if I cheat them, the cowboy hat, this cowboy holds a grudge. If I ever cheat them after, after I cheat them, then they will never cooperate with me again. So they cooperate right up until, it feels like a latch. They cooperate right up until I cheat them and after that, they just cheat me. Now, there is a reason I promise why I'm showing you all these different strategies. We've got one more to look at. And I'm just gonna tell you what this one does. Um, so in the Sherlock Holmes hat, uh, this is a sort of a detective. He's trying to figure out what we are doing. So he'll cooperate with us at the start. Then he tries cheating. Now, if I just keep cooperating, then uh, he is going to uh, realize that I never cheat. And so that means he can just cheat me as much as he likes. So he basically will always cheat. Uh, whoever's playing the recording of me, it, it's kind of difficult for me to say things when I'm hearing a recording. Okay. Uh, so the question is this. What happens when these different strategies play each other? That's where it starts to get interesting. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Richard. Richard, which of these strategies, if they all play each other, we're going to play 10 rounds each against everybody. So in other words, this guy's going to play 10 rounds against that guy, and then 10 rounds against that guy, and then 10 rounds against that guy, and so on. So which of these strategies do you think is going to be the winner? You're on mute, Rich. Yeah, I was on mute. Okay, so Peter, is that for Rich or Richard? I was, Richard. Thinking, I was thinking Richard, but it could be for you if Richard doesn't want to answer. Yeah, good. <laughs> I played this a few times with Peter, so I'll refrain from this. So, uh, but personally, I, I, I think uh, probably the, uh, either the copycat or the detective is going to be one of the, the better options. Let's, let's try the same detective and see what happens. So I'm gonna whiz through this very fast uh, because the, where I wanna to get to is the next bit. Um, so they play each other and play each other and play each other and play each other, 10 uh, different permutations and they play 10 times each and the winner is indeed the copycat because the copycat is the most adaptive. Uh, uh, so they, he gets uh, 57, uh, the detective only got 45, so did the the black hat who always cheats. Um, the grudger did mildly better because again, they were a bit more adaptive Stop. and everybody took advantage of the all co always cooperate. Where this gets to have cultural significance is if we introduce an idea of evolution. In evolution, you have to have sex and you have to have death. So uh, what we're going to do is, we'll, we're gonna begin with death. Uh, uh, the five lowest scores are going to be eliminated 
And then we're going to have some sec called reproduce the five highest scores and replace the lowest score in players with them. And let's see what happens. So we'll begin with a whole bunch of all cooperates, some all cheats, and some copycats. And uh, Haveth, perhaps you'd like to, to uh, have a guess at uh, which one of these is going to win it. Um, I think as the majority will be uh, cooperating, I guess the cooperation would win. Let's see what happens. So what we're doing is everybody's going to play everybody. That's why we've got all this really dense network of things. And they're going to play 10 times. And then the so scores are going to be totaled up. And then we'll do this elimination of the bottom five. So everybody plays and we eliminate the bottom five. Uh-oh. We reproduce the top five. Oh, this doesn't look very good. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. We play. We eliminate the bottom five. Oh, no. Oh, maybe these black hats are onto something. We play at the bottom five. We produce the top five. It, oh, I'm scared. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then the bottom five. Oh, wait a second. They no longer have the always corporates to exploit. And these, these copycats, they are playing each other as well as the black hats. That means they're scoring higher than the black hats, always. They play, they're at the bottom five. Oh, so it looks like the copycats are very successful. Reproduce the top five. Okay. Let's try it when we've got the other, the other strategies involved as well. And so now we've got grudges and we've got detectives. Uh, let's see. Copycats. Well, it seems like copycats always win. But that's not all there is to it. So, um, well, let's, let's start with the extreme case. We've got all, a whole bunch of all cooperates and life is good. Uh, and you would expect that we would see the same thing as last time. And indeed we do. The black hats are made by all cooperates and then the copycats are made the black hats. That's with 10 rounds per match. Let's try bumping that up to uh, 20 rounds per match. Is it the same? Looks the same. If we take it down to say, uh, three rounds per match, what happens? Ah, so there's not enough of um, an initial, sorry, there is too much of an initial advantage for the cheats since they, they, they get an advantage at first. Um, there's an initial advantage for them uh, when there are copycats around. Ah, okay, but three rounds per match. And it turns out there's a, a very specific point. If we play six rounds per match, then the copycats, since they're playing each other as well, then they win. But at five rounds per match, five rounds per match, the black hats win. So it might not be such a good thing that safe has five sprints in a product increment. No, it doesn't generalize quite as easily as that. Nevertheless, what we're seeing is that there is um, there's a real benefit to having a lot of feedback before you make a decision. So, and it does generalize to that extent, but there's, there's more to it than that. Um, so let's play with incentives. Right now, now we've got um, this business where there's um, plus two for, um, uh, for cooperating and, and the plus three if you cheat them or minus one if you get cheated. What if we reduce the incentive for mutual benefit? We reduce that to a, a plus one. We'll try that. Now we're going to have the same game as before. So as to say, 10 rounds, everybody uh, pays everybody for 10 rounds. We'll see what happens. It should be that the copycats win. 
but they don't. All right, uh, let's try bumping it up to plus three instead of plus two and see what happens. Can it be? Do my eyes deceive me? The old cooperates are winning, or at least, the, I mean, there are a few uh, of the copycats around, but there's plenty of pink hats. Oh. Incentives for mutual benefit are very powerful. Maybe they're not that powerful. Let's try, let's try bumping up the incentives for cheating. I'll put a plus four there, and I'll even give a plus one on both cheating and see what happens. Oh, at least it's all copycats. So this is the, the highest influence uh, setting here. You can play with these. This is this is this um, evolution of trust. If you just Google for it, it's a free JavaScript thingy uh, by a fellow named Nick Case. He did a beautiful job on it, based on an 80s popularization <coughs> of John Nash's um, uh, 1940s, 50s game theoretic work. So anyway, um, that's really, really interesting because most of the incentives we give people, KPIs and OKRs, they are competitive incentives. We want them to compete to get the bonus. We're not giving them both or giving everybody a bonus if the business gets better. We're, we're giving people bonuses based on these intermediary measures, whether it's uh, velocity or quality or something else that the KPIs are based on. This is suggesting that that's not very smart. But there's more to it than this. Because something we often see with our clients and with our coaching colleges is miscommunication. There's lots of ways that people can miscommunicate. The more intermediaries between two people trying to communicate, which is even more middle management, the more opportunities for mistakes. The shorter the meetings, we could leave things out. There's lots of ways. Well, let's see what happens anyway. So we have two copycats. Well, we're a copycat. The other player is a copycat. So since we're a copycat, we are required to cooperate at the start. That's, the, that's where that strategy begins. So we cooperate. They cooperate. Everything is good. And we want to go and cooperate again because we're a copycat, so we cooperate. And oops, we, we slipped. We accidentally cheated. But they cooperated, so since we're a copycat, we must cooperate, but they are a copycat too. So they must cheat us. And since they just cheated us, we must cheat them. And as you can see, we now have the Hatfields and the McCoys. And this is the basis for all politics in the entire history of the human race. Um, and uh, the, the corporations we work for are full of people playing these games because they know that these games work, they win. So these mistakes are also extremely powerful. And to explore what happens when we have miscommunication, we're going to have three extra kinds of strategy. Copy kittens are just like copycats, except you have to cheat them twice before they will cheat you. So they are more tolerant of, um, of mistakes. Simpletons, these guys are just stupid. Uh, so if you cooperate, uh, well, stop by cooperating, but if you cooperate back, they will do the same thing that they did last time, even if it was a mistake. And if you cheat them, they will do the opposite thing to what they did last time, even if it was a mistake. So their strategy is just stupid. Um, and then we have these randoms who just do completely random things. They just toss a coin every time. So if we have a tournament, with a bunch of all cooperates and some copy kittens and some simpletons and some randoms and some copycats, then I would like to know who is going to, um, to win. I'm going to ask maybe, hold on, how about you? Who do you think is going to win? I think the copycats will uh, copycats. Will win. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I should mention there's a five percent chance of a mistake. So with five percent uh, chances of mistake, let's see what happens. Oh, oh no! 
<laughs> oh no, <laughs> the simpletons, the idiots, the stupidest possible strategy won with 5% chance of making a mistake. So this is very, very concerning. But you'll, you'll notice we didn't have any black hats. So let's see what happens when we have some black hats as well. And so this time I'm picking people at random. Uh, Craig Luca was it Lucia. Lucia, I think. Uh, if you would unmute. I think I'm actually soft. It's Lucia. Thanks, Peter. Oh, um, I'll go for the copycat. Copycat? Okay, let's see. All those black hats, I don't like your chances. Uh huh. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. I think it's copy kittens, actually. So what we saw was that the black hats took advantage of the simpletons. And then copy cats and copy kittens were able to eliminate the black hats. Okay. So 5% chance of making a mistake. Well, what if we ramp that all the way up? Let's say 50% chance of making a mistake. What happens? Well, 50% chance is effectively saying that everybody is just flipping a coin. And depending on the mix of players, I have seen every single role win this. So it just depends on the luck of the draw. Although it looks like the black hats are winning here, but it's very random and I've seen all kinds of things happen. So I'm gonna stop that one there because it can go on for a very long time. I am going to decrease the chance of making a mistake just a little, little bit. I'll take it to 49% chance of making a mistake. And uh, to reiterate, a mistake would be um, you tell your manager, hey, when you go to the next steering committee meeting, you've got to tell them we've got this problem with the release procedure or with uh, the testing environments or whatever it is, some critically important thing. They go to the steering committee meeting and unfortunately, They've got a lot of things they have to communicate and they run out of time and they don't get a chance to communicate that. Or they didn't understand what you said and, uh, and, and they get it wrong. Or they say the right thing, but they misunderstood. The more intermediaries, the more it's like the kids game of telephone or uh, back in the politically incorrect 20th century used to call it uh, Chinese whispers. This is a game you play with little kids, you get them sort of in a row and they pass a message on and you, what comes out at the end of it is whisper it to each other. It's, it's very, very surprising. So anyway, um, you could do the same thing. It's quite a good conference game if you just get them to sort of imitate uh, some motion. They, so they turn around, see what motion was done and they have to turn back and the next person in line has to. Anyway, um, so if we have 49% chance of making a mistake, let's see what happens. Oh, it's different. Something's happening here. The black hats are able to take advantage. So just a tiny little change means they could take, well, let's try, let's tell a huge amount of miscommunication. Let's take it down to say 25%. And black hats win almost immediately. And they win at all the numbers between 25 and 50 take it down to, let's say, 15% chance of making a mistake. Because I know what happens at 5%. 5%, the copy kittens and copycats win. But the black cats are winning. Okay. I'll track it down to 10% chance of making a mistake. Black cats win. Okay. 9, 9% chance. Black hats win. Eight, eight percent chance. I know it's around here somewhere. Ah. So the amount of miscommunication, the amount of intermediaries, um, that's really critical to the behavior of the organization. So we've learned a lot of very simple things. <clears throat> There's a sandbox mode you can play with, but I want to sum up the results we've got so far. So 
the more repeat interactions, the more that we test our assumptions in our conversation before making a decision, the more we tend to form trust relationships. Because you, you don't get a chance to cheat. You know you're going to have more interactions with this person. So you don't want to cheat them. Um, the more we reward mutual benefit, the win wins, the more we get trust forming and the lower the miscommunication. But the very biggest and most important thing of all that we have learned is a lesson about who can fix the problem. Because we are used to, those of us who are coaches, we're used to the idea that the problem is that bastard in the corner office. If only that bugger were to just, just straighten up and fly right, then everybody else would dance differently. It would be great. But the fact is, and most of us know this, that guy in the corner office, he goes home on the weekend, he kisses his wife, he tucks his kids into bed, he pats his dog, he has a barbecue with his neighbors. He is the soul of friendliness and trust until he comes back into the office on Monday morning and he acts like a rat bastard again. And the reason he acts like a rat bastard is because he knows that according to the rules of the game, that's the only way he can win. That's the only way he's gonna keep his children fed and his wife happy and his uh, meat supply ready to make barbecues for, for the neighbors. So point is, there's only one person in the organization who can change the rules of the game. And if you are a coach, that person is you. The only people who get to say, hey, the way that we're rewarding people, the way that we've got things set up structurally, it's all promoting bureaucracy. We're not going to be able to get business agility if we don't do something about these things. The only person who can do that is you. So let's have a look at the sorts of things that you're facing. Now, um, I've been gassing on for a while. Uh, I'll take another couple of questions while I switch gears. Okay. Uh, Sabrina? Yes, so we do have a couple more questions that have come in. So we've got one from Hasef. I think I've said your name wrong. I'm terrible at this. No, it was wonderfully spoken. Oh, I yes. should have known that. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, okay. again, me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was wonderfully presented. I said that it gave me goosebumps. It's really something. Thank you, Peter. So, so my question was, um, we know that big companies and old companies are just in love with KPIs and they just want to know how to measure performance. Yes. So what would you, your advice on the road to this cultural change towards more cooperation? Where, what is the very first starting point that you can advise us to go with? Really good question. So um, there is uh, this fellow, Ellie Goldratt, who uh, is best known in the agile world for the theory of constraints. So probably the very simplest theory ever made. All he said was that in any system of production, uh, there are many bottlenecks and one of those bottlenecks will dominate the behavior of the system and called it the constraint. And what he said was that if you are working on any other bottleneck apart from the constraint, that work is wasted because you won't increase the end-to-end -end throughput of the system. Now in Xscale, we think about market constraints, not just constraints in the organization. We think about business throughput uh, defined in the economic terms that Goldratt defined it because Goldratt faced the same kinds of KPI game playing problems that we do. He faced cost accounting based management, same way we do. And he found, he would tell them about this. He would say, there's a, you look on the production line and you can see there's a machine in the middle. One that going ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. I'll call it the chunking machine. That machine is your constraint. And you can see there's a lot of things going into it and there's a little stream of value coming out of it. That is your constraint. And the managers would go, oh, Mr. Goldratt. Goldratt passed away, I think, 10 years ago, so ago. But uh, brilliant, brilliant man. And um, a lot of people carrying on his ideas, in particular, ideas about throughput accounting, which is what I'm just getting to. So, Mr. Goldratt, Mr. Goldratt, thank you. Now we understand. 
What we need to do is fire half the people who are producing the inputs to that chunking machine because that will reduce operating expense and maximize utilization. And Goldratt went, no, you buy another chunking machine. That's gonna increase throughput. That's your constraint. And they would go, but that's not going to reduce operating expense. So Goldratt had to invent a kind of accounting called throughput accounting. Very, very simple change in ideas. And if you go and look at the Xcal podcast about throughput accounting, you'll have me and Stefan Walters explaining it to you. But uh, there's lots of stuff about throughput accounting in uh, Lean Kanban. There's lots of stuff about it in Tameflow, Agenda Shift. It's one of those things that um, it makes a huge difference. And if you shift the accounting paradigm to that, then you only have one problem. And your problem is you have to shift the reward models as well. There's a thing called open book management, which I'm not going to talk about here, but I do want to talk about this slide because um, it's relevant. This is, um, if you go and look on LinkedIn, I've got a, an article called The Tragedy of the PMO. It's based on a, another game theoretic problem called The Tragedy of the Commons, uh, which I'm not going to go into detail about now because it's going to take too long. But basically, it's a kind of um, a game of poker where everybody winds up losing their shirt. They don't expect them. Expect it's a really good game to play with execs. They all think they're going to win uh, because it's the game that PMOs play. Uh, it's the reason we have technical debt. It's the reason we have legacies. It's the way legacies are generated. We have this entire agile movement, the software craftsmanship or clean coding, depending on the books you're reading, movement that basically blames technical debt on the developers and it's not their fault. It's cost accounting and individual competitive rewards. We also have a remedy of the PMO, which you'll find on that page as well. And it's a, uh, there's a set of games that we, we play in, in uh, the X-Scale Business Agility course. Um, it's, um, it's a really neat game because it's one of those games that has this brilliant oh shit moment where the executives as they're playing it, one of them will suddenly go, this is what our PMO is doing. We have to stop this. We have to stop this now. What we're doing is wrong. And the moment you hear that, you don't have to tell it to them. You don't have to tell them they're wrong. It's a very beautiful moment. Anyway, getting back to the question, that idea of rewarding improvements in end-to-end -end business throughput, and they're hinging bonuses on that rather than KPIs or OKRs. Maybe that is an OKR, but it'd be the same OKR for everybody. Um, makes a huge difference. It's okay. Now, I'm yep, going to, I'm, I'm going to move on because otherwise we won't get through this, this stuff. We do have one more question, if that's possible, because I oh. know the person who asked the question is going to be having to leave in a minute. So, Stan, okay. you've actually got a question for Peter. Go for it, Stan, but make it quick. Yeah, no, that's fine. This is all really, really fun. Um, so uh, when I studied game theory on my MBA, uh, we, we covered quite a lot on messaging and actually kind of like passing information outside of the model you just said. Um, yes. Does that make a big factor as far as you're concerned? Uh, yes, and we're going to be looking at messaging structures as we go through the next bit, so yes. Fantastic, thank you. Good. Now, um, this is rather a depressing little cartoon. Um, I, I, I expect everybody's been able to take it in. But uh, if not, I will give everybody a copy of the presentation afterwards. We distribute it under the Creative Commons, uh, no, no derivatives, no commercial license, just uh, so that that way people can't start saying, oh, this is Y scale or Z scale or whatever it is, but we're not really head up about it. Um, and a lot of the graphics are, are just borrowed from Google sources. So um, you get the idea. Poor Nell's Iron Law of Bureaucracy. Jerry Pornell, the science fiction author, he had a, a column at the back of Byte magazine for 20 years. He passed away two or three years ago now. Uh, he said that an organization contains two types of people, those who serve the purpose of the organization and those who don't, and all organizations evolve until they're controlled by the second type of people. Uh, I already talked about Apple under Cook. Um, now, you might not think much of Jobs. You might think, well, he was a bastard. He was very difficult to get along with. And he was a bastard, he was very difficult to, to get along with, but he knew how to harness genius. 
And the one, one thing you can say about Apple and Jobs was that it was not bureaucratic. It was um, a factory for disruptive, innovative ideas. And those ideas cannot survive in a bureaucracy. So what else can we say about bureaucracy? Uh, I, I'm fond of golden age science fiction authors. Heinlein said a bureaucracy consists of a surprise party department, a practical joke department and a fairy godmother department. But the fairy godmother department is staffed by a single elderly clerk who's usually out on sick leave. Um, all three departments do things that um, are not based on reality. The, the surprise party department does things that are embarrassing. The practical joke department does things that are harmful. The fairy godmother does things for you that you like, but you didn't earn. So this is about disconnects between doers and deciders. And in what we've just seen, looking at the game theoretics, uh, where we saw miscommunication was a critical factor. Well, this is what Heinlein's talking about. Uh, and then Kafka, you can't talk about bureaucracy without talking about Kafka. Every revolution evaporates to leave behind only the slime of a new bureaucracy. Uh, if you've been through a few transformations, you know just what he was talking about. Uh, these days, as a coach, you walk into an organization and whether you are doing a DevOps transformation or a business agility transformation or lean or a digital or whatever the heck the transformation is, you can count on there being slime from previous transformations. Well, maybe not so much this year. There's been a, a tide of change that's washed through all these organizations and taken quite a lot of the bureaucracy along with it. Unfortunately, it's been so much change it's taken a lot of the business along with it too. So if we're going to be able to adapt to change, then we're going to have to be able to deal with bureaucracy. And bureaucracy takes this stereotypical form of a command and control tree. And you might think, well, look, it's not so bad if we have a, a project manager, a good one, or a scrum master, a good one in our team, uh, they can make life a lot easier for us. They can field a lot of the nonsense and they can protect us. And really, scrum master was invented as a defense pattern uh, so that you could run agile teams in a bureaucratic organization. But Often these days, that's not the problem. We're not in an organization that's officially bureaucratic. We're setting the organization up to be bureaucratic and the scrum masters and the project managers, they'll play the game. So let's imagine that six people is the maximum number that can just self-organize without having a project manager or a scrum master. You think about a startup. Six people is a good number for a startup because it's three pairs, it's also two triples. Triples are really good for the flow of learning. If, if you and I are having a conversation, since I guess on a lot, as you can tell, uh, we, we might get stuck in a rut in our conversation. But when Rich walks up and uh, he listens to the conversation, Rich is often thinking about what's the next conversation? So he'll say, hey, what about this? And then you might go, hey, actually, I know a lot about that. And then you and Rich are having a conversation. Now I'm thinking strategically, where is this going? Can I get ahead of it? So a conversation with three people is a lot more plastic, a lot more flexible than a conversation with two. When a fourth person walks up, it naturally splits into two pairs. So that's why triples tend to be kind of magical. So six is a good number for that. Now, if we add uh, one extra person to get to seven, then usually the person who is the most... Um, talkative or the best listener or the most powerful or the most beautiful. There's lots of other reasons why someone might wind up being sort of the traffic cop in some conversations. Um, so what would happen there is there's a change, like a, a step change between a group or a team where most of the conversations are face-to-face, -face, they're direct, and a team where maybe about half, half, Half conversations are, um, I say to Bob, hey, Bob, when's Jill going to be free? Because I need to work with Jill. And Bob says, well, let me go and ask Jill. You just keep working on what you're working on. Hey, Jill, when you'll, will you be free? Oh, I'm, I'm busy this afternoon, but I'll be free in the morning. Well, Pete, Jill will be free in the morning. So that traffic co com, uh, kind of thing, it's not a big deal. In fact, it can be helpful. 
I don't think it's necessary. And I think you can actually have a lot tighter team without it, but I'm not gonna tell you that a good Scrum Master is useless. So, but there's this number, the delegation collaboration ratio, which is about the, the ratio between direct face-to-face -face communications and indirect ones. And when we have multiple teams in a managed program, well, then we have more possible hops, so we have more miscommunication. But the number of direct communications we can have is still just six. Now there's, uh, if we have 43 people, uh, I think that's how I'm counting it, uh, then uh, I've got, I can't do math and talk at the same time, I think 37 um, uh, thereabouts indirect conversations. So the delegation collaboration ratio is going up by powers of six or thereabouts. And the same thing happens if I keep on, obviously not all, uh, um, not all tree structured organizations. I'm not saying the hierarchy is bad. Hierarchy is enormously useful. Um, uh, we, we're not gonna get rid of hierarchy no matter what we do. But tree structured organizations, command and control based organizations, committee based organizations, there are problems there. So if we look at the power series that happens as we go up, well, we get to a place where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. Or we have an EPM or everything. Anyone, anyone who's worked with an EPM always seen the amount of waste that comes out of that. Um, if we have uh, the US military and there's 11 levels of hierarchy, the left hand doesn't even know that the right hand exists. Uh, I once had an opportunity to ask uh, a fellow who, Dr. Dave Gifford, he was senior scientist with the CIA for 28 years. And I had an opportunity to ask Dave, I worked with him. Uh, not at the CIA, it hasn't been clear for anything. He was, he had moved into uh, uh, a startup that I was working for. Um, and I said, look, is it, you know, I just, because I trust Dave. I said, e you're a really good guy. I've been working with you for a couple of years now. I think I would believe you if you told me. I said, is the CIA evil? Because it's supposed to be evil. He said, no, it's not evil. It's just that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And it's not allowed to, it's compartmentalized. He said 95% of the US intelligence budget is wasted on rediscovering things that other parts of the organization already know about, but they're not allowed to tell you they know. Now, hierarchy is not a new thing. All organizations have to have hierarchy. It's a way to limit the number of conversations we have to have in order to make a decision. But this idea of tree structures is a, a very primitive way to set up a hierarchy. The Haudenosaunee came up with this way of doing it that's really smart. And they came up with it in the 13th century. Uh, these two guys, Dekanawida and Hiawatha. You might've heard of a, a poem by Longfellow, the Song of Hiawatha. That's not about the historical Hiawatha. He, he made this poem and he didn't like the way the protagonist's name was scanning. And he heard of this Indian named Hiawatha, who just substituted names. The historical Hiawatha um, came up with this, well, actually he, he was the politician who put it over. Dekanawida came up with it. Anyway, they came up with this way of making decisions that was about maintaining peaceful relations in a large group of people. Now you might go, wait a second, these guys, they weren't working with modern technology. Well, they were working with technology. This is a Haudenosaunee village in the 17th century. And you might be surprised to see that they're not in tents uh, on the plains. These guys had an agricultural civilization uh, and they made permanent wooden structures uh, with apartments in them. And uh, kind of like our apartment blocks, but on this side, they were two stories tall with a row of five open fires down the middle and a very clever system of vents so that the, so these longhouses, they call them, didn't fill with smoke. So they were enormously inventive people. In fact, the word Haudenosaunee means the people who build together, which we would think of as the technologists or the engineers. They just weren't working with electronics, but just because you happen to ride a horse doesn't make you stupid. And these guys were very far from stupid. But they had a system that we could not possibly replicate. And part of the reason we can't 
is that they had um, some social concepts about marriage and the division of labor between sexes that wouldn't work for us. So for example, inside the village, the females control everything. This is a largely a matriarchal society. Outside in the woods, the males control everything that happened out there. But the way that these guys made their decisions was um, a very dense, densely woven social fabric. They had these structures they called clans. Um, and the idea was, that if you were born into a clan and you were male, then you were not allowed to marry anyone in that clan. You had to marry someone in one of the other clans. If you're female, then you would stay in, in that clan. So that meant that everybody in the entire society was either your brother or your sister or your cousin or your aunt or uncle or your father or mother, depending. It was a, a, a really complex system of, um, of relations that determined uh, who you thought of as family as immediate family or indirect family. But basically the way they set themselves up, uh, it, it, they had these clans cutting across all of their decision-making apparatus. And these longhouses were both a physical and a social device for making decisions. So people lived in here, you had uh, 10 families, five on one side, five on the other, uh, each with a little apartment on either side of one of the fires. And those were families of four or five people. So each of these long houses is about 50 people. And if a decision needed to be made about um, who was going to take grandma out for a, a walk of an evening when her joints got arthritic or uh, who was going to empty the latrines or whatever it was, um, they would come up with ways to handle that using a system of treaties internal to their longhouse. Now, they also had treaties across the longhouses. The treaties across the longhouses, but between the longhouses, were not allowed to overrule the treaties within them. They had this really neat system where the eldest female in each clan would pick a male representative to go along to a council to represent the clan. If the male didn't represent the clan's proposals faithfully, then the eldest female could simply remove him. They called it taking the horns off his head and replace him with somebody else. They called them peace chiefs. Um, so they had these little councils, very different to the way we do democracy. Instead of saying, oh, well, everybody has to have a representative, they would get their proposals together within a clan at a particular level of the society. And they would hand it to their representative and their councils were little, usually five people. And the beauty of that was if the council got together and made a decision that one of the clans went, wait a second, that wasn't what any clan proposed. We can't live with that. Well, then it would, then it would, they would deal with what had been learned and it would, that decision would go back to the council. None of these treaties were set in stone. They were all adjustable. None of the treaties at a higher level, like between uh, the longhouses in a village or between the villages in a tribe. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. They couldn't overrule the treaties lower down. So a village treaty couldn't overrule a longhouse treaty. And if we go to the next level up, a tribe is a group of villages uh, on each side of a river. I should probably point out, if we look at a village, we've got, just as you've got families on either side of this row of fires in a longhouse, in the village, you've got longhouses on either side of um, this clearing. There's an extra one where they have their um, village council meetings and get togethers and so on. I think it's a low row of the trains outside of that, if I understand correctly. But anyway. Um, Peter? Yeah. Just a reminder, we're going towards the end of the, of the time. Um, no worries. So if everybody, if you could stick with us for another five minutes, it would be great. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to zip through this. Um, the structure of the whole society is based on longhouses, longhouses of longhouses of longhouses. So when we're talking about fractals, this has a very densely woven fractal structure. What we looked at just a moment ago was a European map of the Haudenosaunee. This is 
one of their maps of their society. Here, every bead is a, uh, a village and every string of beads is a tribe and the rows of beads, the strings of beads between the dots, those are nations. At its peak, this society was between a half a million and a million people. And it maintained a descaled business agile way of doing things for about eight centuries. In fact, it's still around today, but they came to grief after the American War of Independence. There's a lot more we could say about that. And there's a lot of symbolism baked into this picture, but I'm gonna skip over it because I wanna talk about just a little bit more about the kinds of structures people have been talking about when it comes to fractal organization. Folk who are familiar with holacracy, sociocracy, talk about fractals a lot here. And trouble is when things get complex, they don't have as an easier time of it as uh, the Haudenosaunee. Uh, sociocracy and holacracy, when it comes to getting a lot of people involved, have caused quite a lot of grief. Uh, we could talk about Spotify. The one thing they really got right was this idea of cross-cutting chapters that works like the clans. But again, when it comes to doing things in the large, they come to grief. So since we only have uh, five minutes or less, um, I want to talk about uh, four things that we need to worry about that they don't. If you are interested in what sorts of structures come out when we worry about these things, then you need to go and have a look online at something called the Camelot model. It's called Camelot because it's only a model. It's not an ideal, you don't have to imitate it. It's about how can we set things up in such a way that we don't break the Dunbar limits, which is to say the power of free scaling, that we have breadth first refactoring, that we have these cross cutting chapters or clans or quality circles is the same idea and we don't fall back into command and control. We could talk a lot about descaling metrics, but I wanted to get to one more thing before we go, because it's useful. And I want to leave you with this since I've gone on longer than I should. Um, okay, leadership as a service. So this is fundamental to the way the Haudenosaunee do things. This is fundamental to the way we do things in X scale, because this gives us a way to promote consensus decision-making at all different levels of an organization. Um, we split the management function into three parts. We could call it a chair or a speaker, a leader and a team. The speaker works a bit like a scrum master, maintaining time frame and ceremonies for making decisions. If and only if the team isn't unanimous, then a leader decides. And the neat thing about this is you can have different leaders for different things. And when I was talking about Steve Jobs at the start of this, that was exactly how Jobs ran his meetings and the decision-making worked in Apple under Jobs. There's a lot more to say about that. But I guess if we're gonna have some Q&A, maybe we'll fit some stuff in about that too. How's that for five minutes? Do we have any more time? Excellent stuff, really Thanks. good. Um, do we have any more questions? Before we do the questions, before we run out of time, I've got to do my plug, unfortunately. So if you um, haven't already signed up, please do sign up to our Agile Leaders and Managers group on Meetup, so then you can get advance notice of our following meetups coming soon. We do have a meetup coming soon on the 10th of November. I've already plugged it in the chat. Also, it's my birthday on the 11th, so I'm going to force you all to have a drink. Um, so please do add yourself, we do have space, but also please do um, add yourself to our managers group, as well, add your leaders and managers group as well. So I'll, yeah, do a quick, I'll do a quick plug too, if it's okay. So uh, I, was just, I was just going to remind you on that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So October 22nd and, or 23rd, depending on which side of the planet you're on, we are running an online game without thrones where you can actually experience descaling and leadership as a service and Camelot in a free workshop. Um, we're using Miro and Zoom in a combination you've never seen before. It's really good fun. We ran this for Spurbank in April, but we have a better version we ran for them. So you'll be doing groundbreaking stuff. And we're expecting to uh, get pure autonomy and alignment, uh, control and constructive work online with a group of about 160 people. No command and control at all, zero command and control. Uh, on the 10th and 11th of November, we're doing, uh, or 10th or 11th, depending on the side of the world, we're doing a campfire meeting with Steve Tend and myself, Minton Brooks and Herbie about how these two toolkits can be used together um, in an agnostic mode. And November 30th, we've got a bunch of X-Scale uh, coaches who are kicking off 
a new round of uh, Excel Business Agility courses in EU and US. These are uh, six three-hour sessions each where we will go into a lot more depth and over and with gaps between these three hour sessions so you can actually ask questions and do homework and think about things run them in three week periods so that, that way you have plenty of time to think and it's all done online and anyway it's coming up that's it and I've added okay so so peter are you also going to offer a discount for members of the agile leaders absolutely. meetup absolutely uh so uh, we will offer a 20% discount. I think I can offer that. Uh, and I'll give you guys a code to use when booking. Thank so, you. Thank you. Uh, it will be Do our pleasure. From the audience at all, as we've got just a couple more minutes left. And you can just blurt them out if you want to. something for, for everyone uh, attending. Uh, all the information I saw a question where do you apply for this please reach directly to this you know uh, meet yeah. up and we're going to share that information from from uh, Peter at the same time you know Xscale is a place to go where most of this information is current yeah xscalealliance.org um, yeah. I've added it to the group don't worry it's all yeah. being put out yeah. by there for you and, thank and, you Sabrina and do Very sign good. the descaling manifesto while you're there Okay, questions. So we've got one. We're also going to have an XBA coaching and course courses. Oh, can we have yes. some information on that? Uh, we were just giving one. So um, XBA is this um, uh, course that's um, it's really the most progressive business agility course in the world. Um, uh, our focus is on business agility first. So this isn't, you know, as an afterthought after you've got some framework doing something with software delivery. Uh, the notion is that if you can't frame up business agility first, uh, it doesn't really matter what you do with software delivery. So uh, a lot of the stuff we've been talking about tonight at a 10,000 foot level, we'll get down in the, in the weeds and do it properly. And we've got some brilliant coaches who have been studying how to give this stuff and working with me for the last year to get up to speed. Um, and they're going to be taking the lead, but I'm going to be there in the back seat to make certain that if you guys have any questions that manage to stump them, uh, you'll have me there too. Excellent. So this is an opportunity for, uh, we got Nick and Gideon, I think on, on the on the call to uh, say hello. So please people just, just reach out to each other and, and say hello. But let's not take up time for questions that we could be asking if someone's got some. So just to confirm, yes, we will be sharing the video um, as it's recorded so you can look back if you've missed anything. So that's one question that's come up. Cool. Oh, come on, give me a stunt. Yeah. I hate not being so, rushed. Uh, Sabrina, would you like to close the meeting for us, yeah, please? Yeah, that's okay. fine. Thank you um, ever so much, everybody, for attending. I hope you did enjoy yourself and you learned something new. I've added to the chat the links to uh, Peter's website and his LinkedIn and everything like that, so please do. Please feel free to add uh, myself, uh, Richard, and Rich um, on LinkedIn. Um, we're all a very friendly bunch. We've got quite a few meetups that we've got upcoming, so keep an eye on our space. But thank you very much for your time. And also feel free to comment on what the best times are for the meetups. Um, I should also ask uh, 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 Rich and Sabrina and Richard and Stan, if I was to stick around for half an hour and run the rest of the presentation here, would you guys mind? We would love to, Pepita. Um, the question is everybody else, you know. Well, they can, they, they'll, they'll yeah, get off the yeah. recording, you see, so that way they won't feel they lost. Let, let's just do that. That's brilliant, actually. So I, I love go. Keep an eye out for the next stage of the recording. We're going to leave this open for Peter to carry it on. So anybody that can stay on, please stay on and join. Peter, we're going to carry on. And if you're not, then please look out for the video. We'll make sure we put that on our account. And um, hopefully we see you all again soon. All right, so we're, we're dropping off. I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, we are going to continue. So I want to pick this up with um, this lovely picture. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the symbolism and then we're going to move into how we can take some of these ideas and apply them. 
Uh, so if I go and do that. Okay. So as I said, this is a, I should say before we go, before we get into this, any questions anyone has in mind they'd like answered before we, um, we go on. Okay, let's go. All right, so um, these ladies here, this is a matriarchal society. They're all part of the one clan. This is the eldest of them. And so this is the clan mother who picks the chief that's going to represent them at the council, the male chief. Uh, these are all chiefs from different clans at the, one, at the same level of the society. So there's actually a fifth chief who is representing uh, the, this clan, these ladies. Now, you can see that these guys who are sitting down, they're, they're in earnest conversation, but there's two groups who are standing up. There's these guys with the very fancy headdresses, and they look like elder statesmen. They're basically chiefs from the next level up. They are not allowed to make the decision for these guys. And if they try, there's a group of guys at the back of the room. These are the war chiefs. They are also selected by the, elder, by the, the eldest female in the clan, the clan mother. And it's their job to enforce protocol. So if one of these guys tries to interrupt or if these guys aren't playing right, then what's supposed to happen is one of these guys from each of the clans, and they're supposed to pick up a handful of pebbles and give a warning and then drop one of the pebbles. And if the, uh, the person who was offending continues to offend, they're supposed to give a warning again and drop another one of the, pe of the pebbles. No one knows how many pebbles they have in their hand, but when they drop the last pebble, they're supposed to leap across the fire and club the offending person to death. Pretty obviously we can't do that. But that kind of checks and balances thing is something we can build into the way uh, that our protocols work. It's not that difficult to do. Now you might go, well, I never heard of the Haudenosaunee. And while they look really pretty and they sound really interesting, uh, how can it be a big deal if I never heard of them? Fact is, most of what's novel about the American form of government, the US form of government, was borrowed from these guys. Benjamin Franklin wrote a large book of uh, writing down all of the treaties that he'd been able to record from. Uh, uh, Jefferson was a big fan as well. Um, their ideas were communicated to Rousseau, a lot of the Republic, uh, a, a lot of the ideas of the citizen as the sovereign came from the Haudenosaunee. So both the American Revolution and the French Revolution owe a big debt to the Haudenosaunee. And Marx and Engels wrote extensively about the Iroquois. So the Russian Revolution as well. And Stanton and Mott, the ladies who started the suffragette movement. They were big fans of the Haudenosaunee because it's a matriarchal society. So this group of people have been the wellspring of democracy in Western civilization. And the fact you haven't heard about them, well, that's because uh, in the War of Independence and the War of 1812, they got screwed over in different ways. And I'm not going to go into deep depth about that. It's a really, really interesting history, but we're going to move on. Now, I am not knocking the ideas of sociocracy or holacracy. I'm raising them because they're also heavily influenced by the Haudenosaunee. Sociocracy came from the Quakers. The Quakers got their ideas from the Haudenosaunee. So, we're playing with ideas that we got from those guys. We're just not aware of it. Unfortunately, just like the US system of government, a lot of the value in the great law of peace has been dropped on the ground. And you can find translations of the great law online if you're interested in uh, what I, which ones I like. I'm happy to, to send you some links. But for now, go and do some research. It's really, really interesting. Um, so there's lots of things you could say about holacracy at Zappos and uh, whether it's continuing there or not. And you could talk about the, the trials done at, at Medium. There's an organization called Organize Agile. I got borrowed this quote from, and this is I think one of their diagrams of what things look like, but you can see the problem just looking at this diagram of what they came up with, that we've got way too many circles and very poor factoring of those circles. There's nothing 
that refactors breadth first in these ideas. Or they do lots of refactoring at local levels, but that means you have endless bureaucratic conversations about, well, how are we going to vary the roles and responsibilities to deal with these problems or those problems? Um, and so you wind up with a huge amount of overhead to get even simple decisions made. Once things are scale up at small scales, uh, maybe up to um, 50, 60, it's fine. Um, maybe a little bit bureaucratic for my taste, but uh, the way that the, that the conventions are set up is bureaucratic for my taste, but the ideas aren't bad. What we're looking for in a fractal organization is something that can work the same way at every level. So that's where these things are coming to grief. Same thing with Spotify. The, the idea of chapters is a good idea, but it's not self-similar with the guilds. And uh, Nyberg in his videos said that you could have tribes up to a hundred people. And he talked about the Dunbar numbers, 150. Dunbar said that there are a number of Dunbar numbers beginning with five or six, and then 15 to 20, and then 50, 60, and then around about 150 to 200. The 150 to 200 is a good size unit to have as a, a micro enterprise. Maybe it's a bit big for a micro enterprise, but it's basically a, a building block for a corporation. It's not intended to be a functional work stream. It's not intended to be autonomous. It's too big. And there's lots of really interesting um, results actual experiments that have been done to back this up. So I'm not going to go into a lot more depth on that. If you want to go and watch the interview with Dunbar, uh, we, we hit on some of that stuff. And I think there's more stuff in the Xcale podcast about it as well. But you can see there's already a fallback to command and control here. Every one of these little squads has a product owner who calls out the mission, what it's supposed to do. Mission command is a good thing. They've got autonomy about how they do it. But these product owners wind up reporting into a tribal leader. And then you've got a traditional command and control hierarchy above that. Because that's the way it worked in 2012, according to Nieberg. According to a lot of other Spotify coaches, that was not the way it worked in their part of the organization. And these days, I've listened to a number of presentations from current Spotify coaches. And I wouldn't want to work there, let's just say it that way. They don't certainly don't do things this way anymore. So Spotify emphasizes that, uh, it's the guys who promoted the Spotify videos, emphasize that there is no Spotify model. It's not a model. It was just a, a, a bunch of ideas they were testing back in 2012. What we were interested in, with in, in Xscale was coming up with a model. Everybody wants a model. We want to be able to say to people, okay, here's a good way to set things up that actually has a pretty good chance of working. You might want to vary it, but here's, here's a starting point. Um, without that, how is someone going to feel any confidence in trying to get autonomy and alignment to work for them? So um, what we decided to do was to think about it numerically. We wanted to set up a model that would optimize well, the first three of these anyway. The fourth one, I would need to talk a little bit more about, and a lot of the X-scale coaches who are listening in are going, wait, I haven't heard about fractal dimension. What's that about? So we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in the next uh, 20 odd minutes. So maximum meeting size. What is, the, what is the biggest meeting that you have to have in your organization to get any decision made across the whole organization? If the biggest meeting that you need to get any decision made is six people. That's a descaled organization. If it's 250, it's not a descaled organization. Uh, what's the maximum number of conversational hops between doers and deciders across the organization? If it's face-to-face, -face, that's descaled. Maybe a, a, a single intermediary is still pretty descaled. If it's 17 intermediaries, um, the minimum feedback frequency, how long, what's the longest period that a decision lives in your organization before it's reviewed and revisited? If, if we have three year plans and we don't revisit them uh, more than once a year, that's not very descaled. If every decision at all levels of the organization 
is revisited every week, which is what happened in Apple under jobs. That's quite descaled. We'll come back to fractal dimension. So we've talked very damn quickly about leadership as a service. Um, I want to talk about the last part of this. There's basically three patterns here. The first pattern is we, we have directly responsible individuals. Let's say that, um, let's keep it really simple. Let's say you're trying to get estimates made and um, you've got a little team and they just can't agree. You're doing planning poker and some people say it's a three and some people say it's a 13. Well, if you're like me, you'll go, I don't wanna, I, don't, I, I know I have to force a decision. We can't sit here estimating forever but I don't want to do it stupidly because I know that if we just average the estimates, we'll, we'll get one that's wrong. And I know that if I, if I try to get voting to happen, I'll get one that's wrong. But what I can do is I can say, well, this is a decision or an estimate about uh, database. So Jill's our DBA. I don't know why I'm picking on Jill. Susie's our DBA. And uh, if you guys can't get unanimous in the next minute, I'm going to have Susie make an estimate. We'll take her estimate and move on. So basically, I'm saying that I have a directly responsible individual. After all, if this is mainly a database story, Susie's responsible for execution. So um, it makes sense that if the rest of the meeting can't get to uh, unan unanimity, then Susie should decide. She's going to have to execute. At the same time, if they get unanimous and Susie disagrees, She's not going to be very happy. So she's now motivated to try and influence them to make a good decision. This is enormously powerful. Now, every DRI is motivated to influence. They're trying to provide leadership to the group as a service to them so they'll make a good decision. At the same time, they don't get to overrule because if everybody else is unanimous, that's the decision that's going to be made. So this is basically the protocol that was used in Apple under jobs. He had a bunch of people he would meet with every week for about three hours. And each of those guys was expected to contribute to the decision-making. If they didn't, if they sat back or if they didn't think hard enough, jobs was a complete tyrant. He would fire people for being too passive. He would fire people for being too aggressive. He would fire people for not accepting the decision of the group. What he wouldn't fire them for was observing protocol. So it's kind of a third, a third, a third. There was like a third of the decisions. Jobs was, if he was in the meeting, he would wind up winning. A third he would lose, but he would accept because it was a good argument made. He wanted the best ideas to win. And so the third in the middle was a, a little bit of one, a little bit of the other. There's no question Jobs was a tyrant. But this idea of being a tyrant about protocol was near and dear to his heart. So the idea was the people who were DRIs in this meeting, I should mention, uh, every meeting in Apple under jobs had to have an agenda and every agenda item had to be attached to an individual DRI. So that DRI had responsibility for executing whatever decisions were made about that item. They would go back to their team and then they would act as the chair or the speaker for the decision-making in their team. So they would pick a bunch of DRIs, decide the decider is what we call that pattern. The business where uh, a DRI can't overrule, but if the rest of the group is not unanimous, then they get to decide. We call that balance of powers. And uh, so decide, decide, a DRI's balance of powers. Those are the three patterns in leadership as a service. Now we've used this at every level of an organization. Masamita took this into Protobanco uh, at the end of last year. And he used it with a group of 13 vice presidents of that bank who had never been able to see eye to eye before. And they loved it. Uh, so much so that it turned what was a seven week gig into a two year gig. And there's a lot of other stories that Massa can tell about that one. Like everybody else, uh, everybody's gigs have been disrupted this year, but we've been using this protocol in the game without thrones over and over again. We've run dozens and dozens of Games Without Thrones in every continent on the planet, and it always works. We've used this at every, we use it with people who don't know each other at all, and it works. So that brings us to Camelot, where we try to leverage this stuff. 
Now we've got videos online about how this works um, and they go into more detail than I'm going to go now. So I'm going to kind of go over this lightly, mainly because I want to get to a single slide where we have a pretty fractal picture about how it looks. And then I can talk a little about fractal dimension, which is what I really want to get to. So the idea is we want to have organizations that are dominated by autonomy in alignment rather than command and control. So self-directing programs or self-managing streams or self-organizing teams sounds very different to most of the organizations we've worked with. How can we get that to happen? This is where we have pull transformations, which I'm not going to talk about now. But that was right at the start of this when I was talking about IAG, that was what worked there. So I like making pretty animations. The, the PowerPoint has this thing called Morph that lets you do a lot of pretty things. You have to pardon me, it's one of my eccentricities. So let's imagine we just have a little team. They don't need all of the stuff we're about to talk about. They, they can certainly get benefit from leadership as a service, but we don't have to worry about aligning them to someone else. If they're just a startup by themselves, we don't have a problem to solve. This idea of steel thread, that's part of pull transformation. We won't worry about that now. But let's double it. Let's say that we've got two teams and some shared roles. Uh, these two teams have a shared product owner, architect, and coach. And those three roles will, if we stagger the meetings, they can go along to every one of those meetings. That's fine. But what, what would be really neat would be if before the product owner, the architect, and coach go along to those meetings, if the analysts from the two teams, if they could meet for half an hour just to get eye to eye on what sorts of problems they're facing, what sorts of things they've learned. And at the same time as the analysts do that, the testers could do it. And at the same time as the testers do it, the designers could do it. And at the same time, the developers could do it independently. So this is, if, if you're familiar with the Spotify model, um, uh, this is chapters. But, well, chapters is simply borrowing an idea that's been current in Lean since the 1960s, the idea of quality circles. There's a lot more documentation about quality circles than there is about Spotify chapters. And what you'll see is that these quality circles work best when there's three people in them. We talked about that before. So if we have those circle meetings before the teams have their retros, well, then those retros will be fully informed about all of the opportunities and issues and constraints, bottlenecks that are going on in each team. And the teams can adapt to each other without having to worry about a scrum of scrums. So it's really neat. And it makes uh, the, the way this works much easier on the product owner, architect and coach because they can rely on everybody already being aligned. They don't have to do a whole bunch of running between the teams to help them make decisions. So if that's what we're doing, we have a very simple life cycle. We have delivery, we have circle meetings and we have retrospectives and we go and do delivery again. And obviously we'd spend most of our time in delivery. Um, if we think of having, let's say, three shifts in a hamburger joint, morning shift, the afternoon shift, the evening shift. And we could, we could do circles across them. Maybe the hamburger flippers would be a circle, the, the chip fries would be a circle, the, the front desk staff could be a circle, the, the cleaners could be a circle. They don't need to do very many circle meetings. Maybe they have circle meetings once a month. The idea with this stuff, if we're talking business agility, it doesn't have to be about software. Um, but we do have to keep these guys aligned because if we do it right, they're all learning and what they're learning can improve our business. Let's say, for example, that one of these shifts learns that a lot of our customers are Polynesian and they really, really want Polynesian flavors in the food. If they can't communicate that to the other shifts, they can't make decisions about how to vary the menu. So what we really want is for those learnings to flow and then we want these guys to be able to make decisions together. We haven't really given them something they can use to do that yet. So if we increase the complexity just a little bit, oh, sorry, this is circle meetings, cross team quality circles. So now you have an idea of what that looks like. Um, we could show you a whole bunch of pictures of it, but that's okay. I'm not gonna worry about that now. I'm going over this lightly. We do the retros after the quality circles. Let's make it a bit bigger. Let's say we've got three teams in a stream. Well, now there's far too many individual meetings for these shared roles to have to attend. So what we can do is we can say to each of these quality circles, 
we want you to pick a representative to go and meet with our product owner and our architect and coach once a week. If that's what we do and we have the same representative every time, that's not going to work very well. Basically, those representatives will start becoming middle managers. But if every circle has everybody take turns being the representative meeting with the shared roles, then everybody gets to have face-to-face -face meetings with them. And if we only have three teams in this stream, well, every third meeting you get to meet with them, that means that the other people in your circle are going to trust you, or they're going to have to trust you, and you're going to have to trust them to have a consistent effect. Uh, if you try and play games, it'll become very obvious very quickly. So that face-to-face -face thing that the Agile Manifesto emphasizes is the most efficient and effective way for people to communicate and make decisions within and between teams. That's, that's what's coming out here too. Okay, let's say that we've got these councils. Now, this is a bit more complicated than it needs to be. And we need to have these activities. We have to prioritize business outcomes. We have to simplify them. We have to share learning across the streams if we have multiple streams. But in this version of these slides, we were expecting to have three different councils. We realized that we have a way to do this with a single council. It makes all this much simpler. But for now, uh, I'll stick it. Oh, well, obviously, I'm not going to rewrite the slides while you guys are watching. So we have this third uh, set of activities to stick into the middle of uh, our life cycle. What we found out is if we do a single council, we can actually have that meeting while we're doing team delivery. There's a lot more work than time taken up with delivery than in a council meeting. So we can have to do all three of these things. It makes everything much simpler. Anyway, so we've got team circles. We've got these three activities, which I'm not going to go into, go into a lot of depth about because I want to get past this so I can show you the next bit, but you get the idea. We have people from the circles coming together to get things done. Here we go. Okay, now I have two streams. Each of them has three feature teams. Each of them has their own product council, which is to say representatives of the feature teams plus the shared roles in their stream. We can have cross stream circles which is what we've got for product owners, architects, coaches. We could also have cross stream circles for quality automation, process automation, production support, you get the idea. The key here is that these feature teams are not having circles that meet across the streams. Their circles only meet within a stream. Otherwise they wind up having far too many people in the circle meeting, we don't want that. And then they, you know, everyone has to wait for each other to talk, like in a big scrum of scrums, it's no, no good. So uh, let's go forward. Cross stream quality circles. Okay. Who ratifies working agreements proposed between streams by these cross stream circles? I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on this. And again, there's videos out there that do. Um, so if I go past this, uh, team retros. Okay, here we go. Rotation of our council members, of the representatives of the circles that are on the council. You'll see if each of these is a team, this team has two members on the stream council. If every team has a set of circle representatives, well, then every council meeting is going to have one representative of each um, circle. And this system of rotations works in such a way, if I can manage to go backwards, I don't think I can without coming out and going back in again. Uh, let me try it. If I go here, you'll see it. The way we work it is such that every council meeting has three members that were on the previous council and three members that are new to it. So councils have memories the same way teams have memories. They know why they made decisions last time the way they did. So this system of rotation is really neat, really simple. So how can we descale if we have three or four streams? Uh, let's make it a bit bigger again. This is where we can have a council at the next level up. These product councils or stream councils, they have representatives that come from their, their stream. The program council has representatives of the cross stream circles. So the product owners, architects, coaches, and so on. They'll each send a representative to the program council. That way we don't have too many people there. And we can have senior management there 
And we can have members of uh, HR or the CFO's office or whatever. Lots of things we can do with that. So, so far, this is a structure that's good for uh, groups of up to uh, 50, 60 people. So that's to say three streams. Um, we've seen the cross stream circles already. This is just showing them where we've got the, the, uh, the stream members uh, they, in parallel on the same graphic. Um, so each of these streams has an epic. We talked about this before. Each team gets a feature to deliver. Within that epic, we have some very simple numerical techniques to prioritize these things. Um, and because we have very few cards on the wall, we have a few epics in flight. Uh, we have a few features in flight. We have a few stories in flight, but we don't have huge backlogs of these things. We're prioritizing as we go because we want to reduce the cost of change. We want to apply the acne. So that's pretty much the whole picture, but you might think, well, wait a second. What if we were, uh, let's see if we can do this. Uh, I'm gonna go past all of that. All of the rotation happens in a synchronous way. It doesn't have to. Uh, I'm going to just pass this too. Uh, I won't worry too much about vetoes here. Here we go. This is what I wanted to do. Okay. So let's imagine we wanted to do this for a whole organization. I could have groups of three programs, and I could have a council for each of those groups of three, and I could basically keep on uh, scaling in a fractal manner. Why would I do that? I don't need to do this. If I could get three teams working in a stream, working this way with uh, the circles and councils, and if I could get uh, three streams uh, working on a single program, so there will be nine teams, that's just about the biggest programs most people ask you to coach. That'd be fantastic. I, I, most of the work we would be doing every day would be autonomy in alignment. I don't need to do anything cleverer than that. That would be a huge advance on the business agile state of the art just doing that. But of course we start thinking about what would happen if we made a bigger fractal. So um, let's see, I'm not gonna worry about the tracking rotations thing too much. We had a system of doing it using clocks and cards. We came up with a simpler way of doing it. Uh, never mind the cards here. We thought we, we might be able to sell those on Etsy but we discovered we could use, use Miro to do this um, uh, where we have a Miro board, to, since Miro is infinitely zoomable, we put all the artifacts that we need for our circles, for our councils, for our teams on the Miro board. And we basically then have zoom rooms that correspond to areas of the Miro board. And we can do this at many different levels. Uh, because this works in a really neat way. This is the three council version. The one council version is much simpler than this. And actually um, it's neat because we can do it using the, the neat little circles within circles we showed before. Because hexagons, if I go back, it's a really threatening looking slide. It looks scary, all those angles. Uh, but when you show loops instead, yeah, it doesn't look threatening. So, okay. That brings me to maybe the last five minutes of what we're gonna talk about today, fractal dimensions. Now, I think most people are, have awareness of really simple fractals like this is a Sierpinski triangle. All you do is you, you just uh, say, okay, I take this triangle and I'm going to turn it into three. I'm gonna divide it into these three. I'm leaving this middle bit out. And then I'll do the same thing to each of those and so on and so on. And I get this very weird looking gasket. And this is a fractal. And it's really easy to, to figure out the fractal dimension of these things. Uh, another example, this is a surprising, at least it used to be surprising. Uh, this is a thing called a Barnsley Fern fractal. And all they're doing is they're just repeating the same uh, subdivision of space, very similar to this, but not symmetrical in the same way that this one is. And you wind up getting a beautiful fern fractal out of it. It looks exactly like if you'd taken a fern in the garden and pressed it in a, in a book, uh, but it's no more conceptually complex than this weird triangle thing. And you can do the same thing in 3D and you can produce things that look like uh, uh, Romanesco broccoli 
it's not an awful lot more complex than, than what they're doing with the fern fractal. They're just doing it in three dimensions, but you, you get the idea already. Um, you can do it with branching structures to make something that works pretty much the same way as the arterial structure in, uh, inside your human body. And you can do it with uh, walls and you'll wind up with something that looks an awful lot like a galaxy. So a lot of the structures that we see in the natural world uh, actually have very simple rules to them. So since most of our organizations have simple rules and we've just been looking at simple ways to do things that are slightly different, whether it's sociocracy, holacracy, command and control, uh, Camelot, we can analyze them the same way. If I've got something like this, this is a way of making subdivisions of my, um, of my organization. And no, this is dynamic because of the rotations, but we can still figure out the rate of increase in the number of parts divided by the rate of decrease in the size or the scope or the budget of the parts. And that rate of increase divided by the rate of decrease, they do it with logarithms, but don't worry about that. That's the fractal dimension. So we can actually figure out numbers on these things. And when we do, we're just playing with it at the moment because it's only occurred to us in the last couple of weeks, hey, we can actually figure these things out. We get typical numbers for bureaucracies. And we get typical numbers for business agility as well. We can calculate these numbers for any graph by using a clique as the ground set, which I sort of talked about at the start of this. And that means we can measure and compare the structural agility of our organizations. And so having a metric that can distinguish bureaucracy from business agility is really, really useful. Quite apart from the other three descaling metrics we talked about before. And if you're interested in the descaling metrics, there's a lot more stuff on that. If you look at the descaling manifesto on Xcal, I saw that Anyway, that's pretty much everything that I skipped over. So I hope that half hour was useful to you guys. I dare say that's a pretty good stopping point. Um, I was just wondering actually if maybe we can, um, if you'd be interested in us setting up another session with you because there's just so much wonderful information you're going through and you can see how keen we all are, including myself, Richard and Rich. Would you be prepared to set up another session with us? Sure. Well, as you can see, not only do we have these three events coming up, but we have some introductory X-Scale sessions that uh, uh, Kamar and Karun are running. So I think there's going to be another three sessions in between these. But I reckon we could do another one of these maybe in December if you'd like. Yeah, I will note that down and we'll get things organized. Right, thank well, you ever so much, everybody. Thank you so much for everybody who stayed the extra time. It was definitely beneficial. Um, and I'm glad that we've kept it all recorded. Um, thank you very much, Peter. It's been absolutely amazing. It's been eye-opening as well. And you're always a joy to see you anyway. So thank you very My much pleasure. for your time.